Sure. Yeah. So my name is Romani. I'm from the Whanganui uh, Tara branch of the International Socialists. I just want to clarify for those who were here for the last session that I am no longer speaking on behalf of the G7. That is, <laughs> that is something I've put in my past. Um, uh, so, um, okay, so uh, just to acknowledge some of my sources before I begin as well. So um, I'm really not an expert on Iran and I am drawing on um, some research and analysis from uh, Beza Tehrani, Yasmin Meza, Bella Beirahi, Simone White, and Freda Afari are some of the people whose research I've drawn on for this talk today. Um, and I've just added an extra bit to my introduction as well that's just occurred to me today during these um, discussions about Islamophobia, because it occurs to me that we are having these discussions in the context of the, in the shadow of the war on terror, and uh, that Christchurch is not that long ago. Um, so yeah, it's important when we're having these discussions for us to be able to separate out um, the uh, actions of the Iranian regime, the identity of the Islamic State from Islam as an entire faith, and to be able to separate out the actions of, say, the clerical institutions um, in Iran and criticism of that from Islamophobia. So when, re when these issues are kind of flattened out to an issue of with Islam, um, obviously that's pushing the interests of racists, of the US, um, of everyone who is pushing Islamophobia for political reasons. And that also serves the interest um, of the most conservative elements of the Iranian regime, who also want to paint this as a matter of um, Islam versus the rest of the world. So it's a disservice to the people in Iran as well to to paint it that way and to the um, you know people of all faiths within Iran. Um, yeah, so there are different positions on faith um, among socialists, um, and I'm personally of the opinion that you know faith can play a liberatory or an oppressive role, um, you know, depending on the context. So I hope that my talk today will um, yeah put us on good footing for having those discussions. Um, all right, so on the 13th of September 2022, Gina Amini, um, also known as Masa Amini, was murdered by the Iranian morality police while visiting Tehran. So Amini was a 22-year-old law student from Sakes in Kurdistan. Um, when she alleg allegedly failed to veil herself properly, the police beat her into a coma and she died three days later. So her funeral quickly became a protest, which then became the largest uprising that we have seen in Iran since 2019, and which continues today. So Amini was the spark that set this fire off, um, but it did not come out of nowhere. So the fuel for this fire was one, the conditions that the Iranians are currently living in and have been living in for decades, and two, the buildup of fight back that has been happening um, over the past few years, and arguably over decades. So in this talk, um, I'm going to talk about the state that um, Iran is in currently, provide some historical context for how we got here, and talk about the protest movements leading up to the Gina Masa Amini protests. So as an introduction, I'll attempt to kind of like give some outline of the situation in Iran today. So in terms of government, the Islamic Republic has a contradiction or a tension in its heart. So, um, and it's sort of right there in the name, Islamic Republic. So Iran is somehow both a theocracy and a republic. Um, so there's an ongoing tension or contest of power between the Iranian state, including the nominally um, elected parliament, um, whose roots stretch back to prior to the 79 Iranian revolution, and the institutions of the clergy, which came into power during that revolution, and that represent an unelected parallel state structure. So this contradiction gives rise to, among other things, um, fierce factional battles at the top of Iranian society. So conservative, moderate, reformist, principalist, all jostling for control and to shape the direction of Iran. The revolution itself was one of many contradictions, and I will talk about this in more detail um, later on in the talk. Um, in the end, it was the clerical forces, very undemocratic forces, which took the lead of the revolution and came to power. Yet the revolution itself was a democratic uprising, so they were forced, at least initially, to make some concessions to that. 
Since the revolution, economic management of Iran has gone, uh, undergone a transformation. So in the immediate aftermath of the revolution, the state owned and controlled much of the economy in Iran. And in keeping with the demands of 79, they were compelled to institute a welfare state and to guarantee a certain minimal standard of living for all Iranians to legitimize their rule. Since then, things have changed. So like um, other countries, the Iranian state undertook neoliberal reforms in the 90s. And in fact, Iran undertook one of the most thorough neoliberal projects in the world. Leaders pursued privatization, selling off assets and industries. Um, and a unique feature of this process in Iran is that when this was happening, the people in the best place to buy were the clerical institutions that I mentioned earlier, um, as the local bourgeoisie had largely fled during the revolution. So as well as being a political force, the clerical institutions are now a central economic force in Iran as well, owning and controlling large sections of industry. And these, um, especially in this, initially, are not people who um, actually had sort of expertise training in managing these kinds of institutions either. So the people of Iran are facing multiple crises. So their rulers are contending with aggression from the US, from economic and military deals with China, in which China is obviously trying to, um, assert, to a certain extent, to subordinate Iran to their interests. The USA has been imposing damaging economic sanctions on Iran for decades. And of course, the regime makes sure that the brunt of this is felt by those at the bottom of Iranian society. Iran was hit hard by COVID with approximately 140,000 deaths to date and 1 million jobs lost in 2020, though some um, have, have come back since then. Um, Iran has extremely low economic growth and an inflation rate that is over 40%. The economic woes are not only due to sanctions. So Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei himself, um, the head of the clergy, admitted in a speech in 2022 the main reasons for the problems is not just the sanctions. A major part of these were caused by wrong decisions and inefficiency. So as well as being subject to imperialism, Iran is a local imperial power in its own right. And the regime's imperial project in the Middle East has helped to further impoverish its own people. So it has pursued violent imperial projects in Iraq, in Lebanon, Yemen, um, and of course, aided in the bloody massacre in Syria. To fund this, it has not only directed money away from services and welfare, it has pursued economic tactics to hyper-exploit the Iranian people. Outlawing unions, attacking working conditions and wages. Iran has one of the lowest minimum wages in the world. And in fact, a widespread problem in Iran is of wages not being paid for months or of not being paid at all. So tens of billions of dollars effectively are being siphoned away from the working class and into the war machine, as well as making sections of the clerical elite and some generals and private capitalists filthy rich. The Iranian regime uses inflated US rhetoric to justify and distract from its domestic and international injustices, but this is wearing very thin with its own people. So the population of Iran is young, overwhelmingly under 30, it is ethnically diverse, with the Persian majority making up 51 to 65% of the population. The rest made up of Azerbaijanis, Kurds, Lurs, uh, Mazandaranis, and many more. The people are highly educated, and 60% of university students are women, though they are only 14% of the workforce and make up the poorest 10% of Iranian society. Both women and national and ethnic minorities in Iran face discrimination and second class status. LGBTQ plus people are brutally repressed. Unemployment is extremely high, particularly among young people. One third of the population now live in extreme poverty and the number of people in poverty doubled in one year between 2020 and 2021. The people of Iran can see that the country is on the point of economic collapse and is also facing huge en environmental crises with water shortages and floods caused by the regime's reckless and exploitative um, environmental practices. When hardline conservative Ibrahim Raisi gained presidency in 2021, 
Voter turnout was the lowest that it had been in more than 40 years, and many believed this election to be a farce, as I see had been handpicked by Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, the Supreme Leader mentioned earlier. So this is the context for the protests that we have seen in recent years. Um, and before talking about recent years, I am going to go back and give some um, historical context for how we got here, focusing in particular on the 79 revolution, as obviously that has shaped Iranian society today. So um, what was the situation in Iran leading up to the revolution? Um, so the history of culture in this area obviously stretches back centuries, um, but I'll just be dealing with the shaping of modern Iran in this talk. And um, the kind of pre-revolution era, I'll just give a sort of very brief um, sort of touch on. Uh, so Iran's modern history has been, uh, has always been shaped by imperialism. So while Iran was never colonized, it faced pressure from imperial powers since the 18th century, throughout the 19th century. Um, in the early 20th century, Iran had a very weak centralized government and there was pressure from below for the government to strengthen and modernize itself, to be less subject to the whims of imperial powers. There were protests um, with various forces, as always, jostling to lead and shape the movements. Um, and without going into a lot of detail, this is the era um, which is known as the Constitutional Revolution of 1905 to 1911. And the result was a constitutional monarchy with a representative government in the form of parliament. Um, and as I understand it, it's the first of that kind of um, revolution in the region. Um, another pre-79 um, development to touch on is the Mossadegh era. So post-World post War II, there were post-colonial movements around the world and the rise of third world nationalism and national liberation struggles. This was the era of Nasser in Egypt, of Nehru in India, of Lumumba in the Congo. So this was a period, there was a period of popular upheaval in Iran that brought the anti-colonial leader Muhammad Mossadegh to power. In a move that I am sure will surprise no one, the US instituted a coup to topple Mossadegh. Um, uh, once again, the people mobilized from below to defend the reformist government that they had put into power. And in, uh, in fact, um, an initial coup attempt failed um, because of these mass um, uprisings to defend it. But the second attempt was successful. Um, and those who had led the mass movement retreated at this point. So the regime in power at the time of the 79 revolution was the, Pal uh, the Pahlavi dynasty. Um, so in the post-World War II era, Iran is being incorporated into world capitalism. Um, the Pahlavi dynasty led a project of economic development that was very top-down. So people chafed against the undemocratic nature of the reforms that the Shah is putting through, the so-called White Revolution. Um, and there are also growing tensions due to the unevenness of this development. So half of the population at this time live outside of cities and these areas are being neglected. Um, the mass of people in Iran are being left behind by these developments while the top are enriching themselves. Um, and as well as the masses, there are other classes who are being disrupted by this process. So there are older classes, the clergy and the landed elite who feel that they are losing power. Um, protests erupt in the late 60s and again in the mid 70s and are defeated. So this is taking us up to, to the time of the Iranian revolution. So over this period, a range of forces have been emerging that are pushing against the Shah's regime. There are the masses pushing against inequality. There is the workers' movement. There are women's and students' movements. There are movements of national and ethnic minorities. And there's also the disgruntled clergy and the landed elites. And this all snowballs into mass uprisings and into a full-blown revolution. So during revolutions, um, people don't only protest, they organize. Um, and in Iran, the democratic bodies which coalesced during the revolution were the Comité, the revolutionary committees formed by people in their neighborhoods in order to um, defend the uprisings, and the Shura, which were workers' councils that came out of the factories. So in these bodies, the people of Iran finally had a chance to have a say in the running of their own lives. Um, and they were formidable forces, so the strikes, 
and occupations led by the Shura um, brought the country to a standstill on multiple occasions. Um, the other thing that happens during a revolution is a contest of political ideas and forces. Um, so there were left-wing currents, including organized socialists in the revolution, um, but at the end of the day, the political forces of the clergy were much stronger and better organized in this period. So the socialist forces that existed at the time were largely influenced by Stalinism or by Maoism and third world nationalism. There was the Today Party, which was the Stalinist party that had not fared well during the Mossadegh era. And there was a new generation of Marxist organizations inspired by Maoism and third world nationalism um, and who focused very heavily in this period on um, street fighting and on opposing the um, forces. Left-wing politics in Iran was also heavily inspired by Ali um, Shariati, who was a man from a lay clergy family who was interested in social equality and anti-colonial struggles. And he talked about liberation um, in a language that people could understand that was drawn from Shia Islam. Um, so his ideas really inspired and motivated a lot of people during the revolution. And they were blending religious ideas with themes of Iranian identity and anti-imperialism. The other main force, obviously, during the revolution was the clergy. Um, so they were led partly from afar by um, the religious leader, Ruhollah Khomeini, who had been exiled for opposing the Shah. The clerical forces were well organized. So when Khomeini re-entered the country, he mobilized the networks around the clergy to form parallel political bo bodies, which were organized enough and had enough social and political standing to rival the existing state. Um, and it's this force that was eventually able to consolidate power and to seize control. Um, and a key factor in this, um, from what I've read, is the fact that the supposedly socialist forces neglected the people's organizations, the Comité, the Shora, um, while the clerical forces took these bodies seriously and tried to engage with them and tried to shape them in, in their own ends. Um, so the final nail in the coffin was the embassy occupation in Tehran. So when the student movement took over the embassy, this caused a schism between the left and the clerical establishment, which finally settled in. The clerical forces gaining the upper hand, um, left-wing forces were rounded up and expelled, and the consolidation of clerical power was accelerated. And the Iran-Iraq war, which began thereafter, was the final moment when that power was consolidated. So this is the source of the contradictions in the Iranian state that I mentioned earlier. So the revolution actually left the dual institutions of the parliament, etc., and the parallel clerical institutions both existing, and the uneasy relationship between them continues to shape Iranian politics. There's a whole lot of history that you have just taken in. Take a moment to just absorb that for a moment. So that takes us through very briefly the sort of modern um, history of Iran leading up to the revolution. All right. So to understand the mass protests and movements that we've seen in the decades since the revolution, we need to understand um, how the direction taken by Iran has shifted over the decades. So the Islamic Republic had come into the world on the back of mass movements of people with social demands. They needed to make some concessions to these demands to legitimize their rule. And the new constitution demanded that they provide a basic standard of living to all people in the country. So in the immediate post-revolution era, the economy was largely owned and controlled by the state and a welfare state was established. Huge projects are undertaken to improve infrastructure, healthcare, education, and to attenuate the urban rural divide that I mentioned earlier. Inequality decreased. But as they were operating in very constricted circumstances, there was a limit on how high the general standard of living could rise in this time. So after the war, things began to shift. So internally, there was a baby boom. Um, on the international scale, the Soviet Union had collapsed and the era of neoliberalism was dawning. As I mentioned earlier, there was mass privatization and the clerical institutions were the main buyers. There were and continue to be factional battles at the top of Iranian society over how to run the economy, with some arguing for greater integration of the world economy and a de-emphasis of the role of religion. 
after 9-11, when Iran was designated as part of the axis of evil, um, a reactionary president, Ahmadinejad, comes to power and doubles down on Islamist identity and the role of the clergy. So that brings us to today. So the Iranians have faced not only a neoliberal onslaught and democratic repression from their own government, but also the Iran-Iraq war, two Gulf wars, the war in neighboring Afghanistan, and decades of economic sanctions. I would also be ready to revolt at this point, I think. Mm. Um, so there were four waves of mass protests in the past decade prior to the Masa Amini protests. So there was the Green Movement of 2009, which was sparked by a fraudulent election. A strong current in this uprising was demands for democratic rights and reforms, um, though the reformist faction among the ruling class distanced themselves from this, these protests. Then there were the mass protests of 2017, 2019 and 2020, which were led by unemployed youth and women and incorporated mass protest, labour struggles and struggles of oppressed minorities. Women have played a key role in all of these struggles. Among the protests in 2017 was the movement called Girls of Revolution Avenue, where young women climbed onto utility boxes and removed their headscarves to protest compulsory hijab. Many of these women were arrested and some are still in prison. In 2020, there was a Me Too movement in Iran targeting prominent men, um, including men in the clergy and in the military, which is astonishing given the risks associated with talking openly about sexual assault. Mm -hmm. In 2021, there were mass gatherings on March 8th, Women's Day, demanding birth control, abortion rights, and opposing gender violence. Mm. Ethnic and national minorities have also played a big role in these protests. The provinces associated with these minorities have often been hit the hardest by the exploitation and repression and have often taken the lead in resisting it. Um, so Armini herself um, was Kurdish and uh, Kurdistan has had among the strongest participation in the 2017 and the 2019 uprisings. The labor movement in Iran has been heroic over this period. So there has been a growing rate of strikes since 2017, which is particularly impressive as trade unions are not legal um, in Iran. So in 2020, this activity escalated into a nationwide strike wave coinciding with the wider protests, which drew in more than 10,000 workers. It was the most significant strike since the Iranian Revolution. Workers from the oil and gas sector took part, as well as health workers, especially nurses and teachers, both of which are women-dominated industries in Iran. Um, car manufacturers, agricultural workers, miners, tradies, transport workers and food workers. It's difficult to get accurate numbers of people going on strike because of censorship and also because strikes and protests are not recorded um, individually. But in 2019, we see 3,530 protests, um, uh, which is 294 a month, 10 a day, some of which is strike action. Um, yeah, so of those, probably around 1,411 were strikes. Um, in the, 2020, that um, escalated to 373 protests a month. And this is happening in the context of COVID. Um, and some of those strikes are demanding things like sanitation and personal safety equipment, so their demands around COVID as well. Um, there's two unions that deserve a particular mention, and I wish I had time to go into more detail about these things because they're, they're pretty interesting and exciting. So there's the Tehran Bus Drivers Union and the Haftape Sugarcane Workers Union. Um, both of which became very active from the early 2000s on, and both of which um, have been active, were active revolutionary unions during the 79 revolution. Um, so there are workers in both of these unions who have been, who are part of those workers' councils back in the 70s. Um, so both of these unions um, were active in the lead up to that nationwide strike in 2020, and both made big contributions to it. Um, so here's an extract from the Half Tapa Sugar Cane Workers Union during the 2020 protests. They say, the only way that we are going to win anything is to stay united, united, united. The bosses want us to be at each other's throats, creating division between Desbul and Arab, Shah and Lur, Arab and Lur. We must have solidarity and stay united if we are to win. 
Puff Tupper has been looked upon as a model for successful strike action by workers around the world. Why? Because we have managed to maintain unity and solidarity. And whenever the Puff Tupper Workers' Union comes out on strike in particular, they mobilize their entire communities behind them. So whole towns are protesting and striking with them. So all of these um, protest movements have had themes of opposing religious fundamentalism, state exploitation, um, the regime's domestic injustices and its imperial activity in other countries. Protests against, against privatization, unpaid wages, and the arrest of union militants have been common themes in the labor protests. The state has consistently responded with violence and mass arrests. In particular, there have been mass arrests of ethnic minorities in recent years. There are political prisoners who have been held for years, who have been tortured, and who have contracted COVID. Um, and the release of political prisoners has been an ongoing demand in all of these protests. And that's also a rallying cry of the international Iranian solidarity movement. So that brings us up to the protests after the killing of Masa Amini. So as in previous waves of protests, workers, students, ethnic and national minorities have all mobilized. Anti-regime anger has exploded, and as I've said, we've seen the largest mobilizations that we've seen since the 2019 revolts. Um, if anything, women have played an even more central role in this wave than in previous protests, and other groups have been more quick to stand in solidarity with women and to take up women's issues. In Tehran, shortly after Amini's murder, thousands of university students took to the streets chanting women, life, freedom, which echoed the 2018 protest chants, bread, jobs, freedom. It has mobilized men in support of women's struggles. Um, scenes of hundreds of men forming human chains to defend women burning their hijabs went viral on social media. Um, and more recently, the Council for Organizing the Protest of Oil Contract Workers um, published a call to action saying, we know how religion and gender discrimination have always been tools in the hand of the government to oppress the entire society, to blacken the lives of the working class as a whole. For us workers, March 8th, Women's Day, is the day to struggle against this injustice. The organizing council calls for all workers in oil and other labor centers to this nationwide protest. March 8th is the day of women, life and freedom. Students have emerged as leaders in this struggle. So shortly after the protests erupted, student organizations came together to issue demands on the government, calling for the dissolving of the morality police, legalizing abortion, equal pay, and the abolition of sexist laws. Students called on the workers' movement to join, arguing that women's oppression must be fought, quote, from the shop floors, to the hospitals and universities, to the kitchens in our homes. And it's not just been university students, but also high school students that have played a role, especially girls. Um, as in the protests of recent decades, the labor movement has played a central part. So shortly after Amini's funeral and in response to a police crackdown on protests, a group of Kurdish opposition parties called a marketers strike that shut down businesses across that province. Militant labor unions have come out in support the half Tape Union mentioned earlier quickly organized protests in solidarity. In a statement in 2022, those workers said um, the Bazijis, <coughs> the Iranian security forces, also came to destroy our strikes. So faced with such a deep crisis of legitimacy, um, the regime has resorted to force and it seems to be more or less the only resource that they have left at this point. The crackdowns from the government have been brutal. So tanks, tear gas, and bullets have been used against protesters. More than 500 people have been killed in this latest round of protests and at least 20,000 arrested, according to the US-based Human Rights Activist News Agency. Torture is widespread and official executions continue. The high school students mentioned earlier have not escaped. Most appallingly, there have been poisonings of high school students at more than 58 schools across at least 10 provinces, which many believe to be the work of the regime uh, mobilizing to crush the ongoing protests of high school students. 
these attacks have prompted um, responses from the teachers union and um, from parents who have been protesting um, the regime with chants of Bazij guards, you are our Daesh, so comparing the security forces to the Islamic State. Despite the repression, the protests continue. So in January, an audio clip of women in Tehran's even prison went viral. Um, they were chanting all for one, one for all, and singing a Persian rendition of the Italian protest song, Bella Ciao, mm -hmm. which you would have heard if you've come to the Iranian Solidarity protests here as well. Mm -hmm. On the 17th of March, the teachers union called a national strike in response to the student poisonings. Um, retired workers, iron smelter workers, power plant workers, um, petrochemical and oil workers, engineers and others have all continued to call strike actions and protests. So beginning to wrap up, um, politically the Iranian left um, faces challenges. So the left was purged after the revolution with many of those of, of the 79 generation exiled, um, some of whom are still operating from overseas advocating for the rights of people in Iran. Um, and during the revolution, over the course of the revolution, the existing socialist organizations were discredited in the eyes of many. Iranian socialists in recent decades um, obviously have faced repression, have struggled to organize openly, um, but have also, according to what I've read, struggled against some of the same entrenched political problems that held the left back in the 79 period. So statism, um, sexism, not being able to shake off all of the sort of male chauvinism that is pushed in Iranian society. Um, and national and ethnic chauvinism and refusal to take up the rights of ethnic and national minorities. Um, but there is a new generation of Iranian socialists and leftists who are pushing back against these ideas. And the hope is that the experience of these latest struggles will help to shape some of these things. There's been a deep solidarity forged between the worker militants and the student radicals. Um, an exciting development was the announcement of the Charter of Minimum Demands of the Independent Trade Unions and Civil Organizations of Iran. Um, so published on the eve of the 44th anniversary of the 79 revolution, the Charter outlines 12 minimal demands of the movement. Some demands concern civil liberties, including the right to independent trade union organization, the right to protest and freedom of speech. Others take up questions of oppression and environmental justice. Notable is the call for the confiscation of private property and wealth of Iranian <coughs> capitalists. The authors of the charter write that governmental, semi-governmental and private institutions have taken the social wealth of the Iranian people and argue that this wealth should be back, put back into the hands of the people for the modernization and reconstruction of education, pension funds and the environment. Um, so this charter is a very exciting uh, political development and it is sparking debate in Iran. Um, so in the Telegram channel of the Haftapi Syndicate, um, some workers were criticizing the charter for its reformist program and its failure to argue for class struggle as a means um, to achieve their demands. Um, so mass movements open up the arena for political debate. Um, and in Iran, there are people who are arguing um, who are waging the argument that the fight for women, life, freedom depends on the working class. And the most radical are arguing that the working class in Iran has the power to topple the Islamic Republic. Um, so what is going to happen next? The fate of the Iranian revolution. We can talk about the prospects in Iran more um, in the discussion and also what it is that we can do and how we can respond um, as socialists internationally. So that's a question that I want to put to the floor and to have discussion around. Um, but I have some, some reflections on that topic. Um, so one is that we should be doing exactly what we are doing. So we should be talking about it, learning about it um, and spreading awareness of these struggles. Um, at one of the earlier rallies organized here in Wellington by the Iranian Solidarity Network, one of the speakers said that what would really crush the spirits of the people protesting in Iran would be our silence, the silence of the people around the world. If people around the world did not pay attention to what was happening to them. 
So the Iranian government has at various times shut down access to the internet or to social media. We have access to it. We have the ability to spread um, information about what is happening in Iran and to send messages of solidarity. Um, when, so we have material for the Iranian Solidarity Group um, on the back table here, which I recommend people grab and have a look at um, and get connected with that group as well. So when they call for rallies here, we should join them. So um, even here in New Zealand, Iranians speaking out against the regime fear repercussions. Um, some are, you know, it takes a certain amount of courage even to join these rallies and some people are not don't feel confident to come out and join them. But the more supporters, the more of us that are there at these rallies, the safer they can feel. And we can send messages of solidarity um, to the brave workers of Iran through our unions. Um, and we can fight back here against the politics that hurt the Iranian cause. So we can fight back against Islamophobia and racism that causes people to ignore or misunderstand these struggles. We can fight back against militarism for the rights of refugees. Um, we can fight against the appalling apologism for the regime, including so-called leftists who want to make excuses for the regime's imperial activity in the region. And we can draw connections between our struggles against sexism, against queer oppression, racism, against environmental degradation and against capitalism um, and the fights that they are waging in Iran because it is the same fight. Um, yeah, and that is the, that's the note that I would want to end on is that the people of Iran are fighting for all of us.